Welcome to Mount Kutha, or more specifically, the Mount Kutha Botanic Gardens where I am right now. In this video, I'm going to explore the history of Mount Kutha. Now I know that there's a quarry there and a lookout. There's something called the JC Slaughter Waterfalls. And there's the TV stations as well, but there's got to be more to it than that. What really is the history of Mount Kutha? But also, I find more intriguingly, how did we hang on to it? Why wasn't it obliterated by mining and forestry in the 19th century? Let's go find out. Just to dispel a little myth right at the beginning, Mount Kutha is not the highest point in the city of Brisbane. That honour goes to Boombana Knob at 432 metres. By comparison, Mount Kutha is a shameful 226 metres. Much of the rock under the area was formed in the late Devonian about 382 million to 372 million years ago. The rock formed from sediments in deep ocean waters. Mount Kutha is part of the Herbert Taylor Range, or just the Taylor Range for short. The range is an eastern spur of the southern end of the Diagula Range. On the 6th of July 1828, uh, Patrick Logan, botanist Charles Fraser and explorer Alan Cunningham were the first Europeans to climb Mount Kutha. In 1839, surveyor James Warner came up here with some helpers and they cleared the land at this summit to create a trig point. This was a place where they could measure the distances between here and other high points around southeast Queensland. So they cleared the land here, but they left one distinct tree there, and over the years that tree died and all its, all its leaves fell. That tree became quite an icon in the landscape, so it became known as One Tree Hill. And that's the spot we use today as the Mount Kutha Lookout. I've always wondered why they're called lookouts. Shouldn't it be an outlook? Ooh. <laughs> that is incredible. That does not show up in my family tree anywhere and there we go i've just ordered the my heritage dna kit and i would like to thank my heritage for partnering with me on this paid collaboration video i'll just keep an eye on the mailbox so you order your kit online and before long it arrives and here it is the my heritage dna kit the test is incredibly easy to do all the instructions are included and it literally just takes a couple of minutes to complete you then bag it up and take it to your nearest post office. While you wait for the results to come through, have a look at the awesome colorization tool on the website. Old family photos come to life within moments. This is my grandma. And then before you know it, your DNA results are ready. Results are in. The email has arrived. You see, as far as I know, based on our family tree, all of my family are from the British Isles. So will something be revealed here that uh, some exotic part of the world? Right, ready to explore your ethnicity. That's a big yes. What do we got? Let's go. 42.4% English. 34.1% North and West European. 13.7% Irish, Scottish and Welsh. Oh my... 6% Italian, 6 no, six. and there's more, 3.8%, two more ethnicities, and it's showing the Iberian Peninsula, that is incredible, that does not show up in my family tree anywhere, there's a little bit from Finland as well, to say that I am surprised at the results is an understatement. Blown away would be closer to it. My heritage, you have totally amazed me. My heritage has a promotion going right now. All you need to do is click the link in the description box, type in the coupon code ROB for free shipping for the DNA kit. If you're thinking about getting a My Heritage account and getting the DNA kit, do it. I feel like a pizza now. All right, I'm about to head into the bush. I've come prepared. I've got my hat. I've got sunglasses. I've got a water bottle, sun cream, an umbrella, a first aid kit, a stick, hand sanitizer in case I touch a wallaby, 
In the 1850s, stolen cattle had been turned loose here at Mount Kutha to be hidden in the various valleys and bushland. It was not an uncommon sight if you were walking through here to come across cows. It was in 1873 that the forests here were declared a timber reserve, primarily for the supply of wood to the brand new Ipswich to Brisbane Railway. They needed wood for the sleepers. And then in 1880, Mount Kutha was set aside as a public reserve for no other purpose whatsoever. Famous last words. In 1881, the Duke of Clarence and Prince George, later King George V, commemorated their visit to Mount Kutha by planting two Moreton Bay figs. They were on a tour of the empire from 1879 to 1882. I mean, there's a big tree up there. That looks pretty old, but I don't even know if it is a Moreton Bay fig. It looks like it. And there's only the one. I don't see a second tree. So maybe that's it. That one just there. In 1883, One Tree Hill became known as Mount Kutha. Henry Radford was clerk of the Queensland Legislative Council at the time, and he went to King Sandy Kowali of the Moreton Bay tribe and asked what the First Nations people called One Tree Hill. The name comes from the indigenous word kuta, meaning honey, produced by the native stingless bee. And the following year in 1884, Henry Radford built a proper road up here to the summit. And this is the road right here. This is the road that dates from 1884. Thanks Henry for building it. Due to the increasing popularity of this area, in 1886, a water tank and a shelter shed were built just up here for the benefit of visitors. In addition to picnickers and sightseers now coming up to the summit in ever increasing numbers, the local cows who'd been hidden in the valleys decades earlier were making a reappearance. Someone wrote to the Telegraph newspaper Monday the 2nd of August 1886. Saturday afternoon last, a very ferocious cow came out of the scrub and actually charged down on some ladies who were under the shed on top of the hill. And if it had not been for the pluck of one of them, would have done considerable damage. As it was, one young lady had a few of her teeth knocked out, after which the cow charged down on two young fellows who were coming up the hill. And as if the 19th century wasn't bizarre enough already, certainly in the 1880s, people walking up this road towards the summit would sometimes find themselves under live fire due to bad marksmen down the hill at the Tawong Rifle Range. Bullets were known to whiz past walkers coming up this road. That's brilliant. The camera, or the camera case, is magnetic. Actually, on the, uh, the down road away from the summit, there's quite a few car parking spaces. It's a fist fight up at the main car park and on the approaches, but here yeah, there's a few. Note to self. In the early 1890s, an economic downturn resulted in areas of Mount Kutha being opened up for quarrying, gold mining and logging. So much for whatsoever. Many years ago, I came to Mount Kutha uh, on a very rainy day. It was the national day of walking, like making the country get out and go for a walk. It was a, it was a national day for it. There's a big spider about to eat a cicada. Right, what was I saying? Yeah, it was a national day of walking. Uh, on this particular day, there would be local councils would organize um, areas in, in popular national parks and in areas where you could go out and walk for a couple of hours with a guide. The day this um, was planned for, unfortunately here in Brisbane, it was pouring rain. So, but anyway, my friend and I went on this, on this walk and we came to Mount Kutha and there were about six or seven of us in this walking group. And I don't know where exactly in Mount Kutha we were, but it was something like this where I am now. Oops, here's a person. So anyway, we're walking along somewhere, with a longer, longer track like this, and we're walking in single file. And all of a sudden the guide up ahead stopped. He was very excited about something. And 
he turned to us and he had his finger like that and he had a butterfly on it, a beautiful little butterfly. And he said, this is a such and such butterfly, I forget the name of it. Uh, and it's very, very rare. It's on the endangered species list. So we're, we're st we all gather around like, ooh, wow, isn't it nice? You know, beautiful, beautiful little butterfly. And anyway, he's looking at it and all of a sudden it, it flitted up and it, it flew away. And we thought, oh, well, that was, you know, that was nice. We continued walking and we're, we're walking single file uh, just on a path like this and for some reason I went right to the back. I don't know why. I was, I was up near the front before. My friend was in front of me and I, I was right at the, the back of the queue walking along a path and all of a sudden that butterfly came right down in front of me, right past my eyes and within a second it landed on the ground right in front of me and I kept walking and I put my foot on it. I trod on it. I squished it into the mud. So I'm standing there looking at this this dead rare endangered species butterfly and like I kind of lift my foot oh no I've just I've just killed it everyone else is walking off in the into the distance that I'm still standing there they're not aware that I'm I'm still here and like do, do I say something to the tour guide or I um I kept walking I, actually I covered it over with my foot a bit I buried the body and uh I quickly ran up and joined the the, the group and I didn't say anything about it to anyone until now. So this path I'm walking along to heads to an old gold mine site, but here in this lovely little spot, which is teeming with um, terrible, horrible, poisonous wildlife, um, this was the site of the pump house. Let's come to another little stop over here with an information sign. It's talking about the bridges that used to exist around here to um, service the gold mine, which is just up there, and that's where I'm heading. And there is in front of me here a uh, an old little bridge, a little trackway bridge, going over the creek and heading up towards the mine. And this is the mining for gold. Oh, this is it. I thought this was going to be like a half-hour walk. It took me about five minutes to get here. This is the ghost hole mine. Down there is an entrance to an old gold mine. Now the gold here at Mount Cutha was of quite a low grade and there wasn't a lot of it. There was no massive gold rush here. It was not a giant industry. It didn't last too long. That's actually something very rare these days is to be somewhere where it's absolutely silent. Well, apart from the breeze in the leaves and the birds and the insects but it's there are no man-made sounds here apart from my voice lovely actually I was trying to have a moment in 1893 the former Shire of Tawong established the Mount Kutha quarry despite many calls for the quarry to be closed and some promises to do so, the quarry remains open today. And the lookout quickly became a very popular place for company picnics. In particular, the Rothwell Company. They came up here yearly for their little picnic retreat. Here they are on their carriage. I wonder who fell off first. In 1912, the Governor General authorised bylaws forbidding certain activities within the Mount Cutha Reserve. The first one was the act of preaching, so that's good. The second one was giving lectures. I'm not sure how tour guides get on with that these days. And uh, the third one was the grazing of animals. It was in about 1918 that the kiosk building was built, although it's closed at the moment for renovations. Everyone's eating just up there. The road that runs around Mount Cutha is Sir Samuel Griffith Drive, but do you know what this road was originally called? It was Coronation Drive. On this 1925 map, you can see the name Coronation Drive. And who is Sir Samuel Griffith, you may be asking? He was the Chief Justice of Queensland and also the Chief Justice of Australia. There's someone behind me. Hello. Yes, it is. Yeah. In 
1943, many areas of Mount Kutha were taken over by the US Navy for a naval magazine and mine assembly depot. Put simply, this was a storage place for mines, ammunition and explosives to be used by the US Navy in South Pacific action. And not that you would know it today, but on either side of the road of Sir Samuel Griffith Drive, at almost regular intervals, you had ammunition dumps. They were buried in holes, they would dig it out, put the ammunition in there and camouflage over the top. This meant that public access to Mount Kutha was now forbidden. And during World War II, the kiosk was commandeered by the military personnel up here. They were the ones running the searchlights nearby. They used the kiosk as a very convenient canteen and probably also, no doubt, for storage of equipment and uh, maybe a bit of accommodation. And right here where I'm standing at the Hoop Pine picnic area is the site of Camp Kutha. Not only was it an administration area, it was also a place of accommodation for personnel. There was a bakery, um, kitchen, quartermaster's store, hospital, everything they needed right here. You wouldn't think today, would you? And here's a photo of what it looked like taken from the main road just over there. Though everything is gone from this site in terms of the US military equipment and buildings, one thing does remain and it's this big bit of concrete slab right here. Today it's used as a picnic area. There was a building here once, and this was the foundation for it. I'm now at JC Slaughter Falls, and this picnic area here is also built on a concrete slab built by the Americans during World War II. Here we are. Another big concrete slab. That area just down there, that's the car park, or one of the many car parks leading to the JC Slaughter Falls. But there's a track up here going to the Bush Chapel. The Bush Chapel, after an arduous 30 second walk from the car park. Here it is in this little clearing in the bushland. This patch of ground here, this concrete slab, was also built by the Americans. This is the third one I've come across. So I'm just heading towards the J.C. Slaughter Falls. By the way, J.C. stands for James Cameron Slaughter. That's it. My guess is this is J.C. Slaughter Falls. J.C. Slaughter Trickle. It actually sounds like someone taking a leak. The Americans left the site with an established road network, a drainage system, concrete culverts, and footbridges around the Mount Kutha Forest Park, investing more than US $300,000 for its whole operation while at Camp Kutha. And then, of course, after the war, the entire area had to be combed for explosives before it could be made safe for public use again. And most of the current paving and brickwork you can see here for the lookout was built in 1951. That's Channel 9 over there. QTQ9 began broadcasting on the 1st of July 1959 with a test pattern. Soon after Channel 7 began broadcasting, and the very first movie they showed was Casablanca. Television came to Queensland with the official opening of QTQ Channel 9. Only six months had elapsed since the giant bulldozers had begun clearing the site on Brisbane's One Tree Hill. And then the following night, the ABC Channel 2 began broadcasting with a message of congratulations from the BBC. It wasn't until 1965, however, that Channel 10 began broadcasting, but back then they weren't Channel 10. They were known as TVO. They became Channel 10 in 1988. Just while I'm filming up here, I'm just going to come down to one of these little picnic benches Lovely little spot, but 
of course, you can't actually see anything other than trees out there. I know trees are nice to look at, but we're on the edge of a mountain here. Wouldn't it be great if those trees were gone and you could see the view? I mean, this is called Range View Park. Well, that's Range View Park over there. But um, there's no view here. I know you're not supposed to chop trees down, but could we just part them a little bit and, uh, and have something to look at? Because otherwise nobody comes here. Freer's Chip Factory. I don't know if the building was actually there where the sign is now or if it was further down that way where the current building is. The Red Seal Chips, they were very popular up here. I don't ever remember seeing them in Sydney. I don't know if they were available down there. I was a Sandboy man myself. 1959 to 2001 the factory was here. Uh, goodbye Mr Chips. This here is the Brisbane Botanic Gardens. It was opened in 1976, mainly as a result of the fact that the Botanic Gardens at Gardens Point in the city was very prone to flooding. We all know about the floods from 1893 and 1974. There's been many others. The discussion to get this Botanic Gardens established began in the mid to late 1960s. Mount Cutha Library and Administration. The books in here in this library are predominantly maybe about 90% to do with botany. And that's no coincidence, of course, we're in the Botanic Gardens. The Planetarium. I happen to know for a fact there are no planets in there. Absolutely beautiful here. What a gorgeous place. It's also Sunday morning, so there's nobody here at the moment. Ah. Look at that. Out there, step down onto the little bridge. Wow. That bridge there, I nearly fell off that back in 1995. I was at film school, university, getting my Bachelor of Visual Arts in Film and Television Production, and we were shooting a music video. It was an assignment. We got a local band, and we were shooting here in the Botanic Gardens, and I was the camera operator, and I was running with the camera, running along here, over this bridge, but because I was trying to look through the viewfinder, I didn't watch where I was going, and I tripped just here. And I went over, head first down into the water, but the, the, there was a, a student behind me, he was running along just trying to hold my shirt or something so I wouldn't fall, but I did. He grabbed my legs just as I went down there into the water. I'm holding the camera. Now the camera back then, we were actually shooting on film. It was a, uh, I think it was a Bolex, or maybe a small Arri, I don't know. We were shooting 16mm film. And a very, very heavy camera, because it had the film mag on top. I'm literally holding the camera before it went into the water by my pinky. There was a little hook on the side of the camera. So there's me, hanging over the edge there, holding this very heavy film camera with my pinky. And Daniel, that was the guy's name, he's hanging onto my legs here so that I don't fall in the water. The band were back over there laughing their heads off. 
What I find fascinating about Mount Kutha is how much of it has actually survived more or less intact. You get Brisbane in the 19th and early 20th centuries, a growing city, and cities, how do cities deal with the need for open space? They need open space. But there was that point in the 19th century where they would see something, a place like this, and go, wow, we can exploit that, we can, we can log it, we can mine it, we can uh, build things on it, we can put roads through it. But Mount Kutha survived. Mount Kutha looms large over the city in the most beautiful and pleasing way because it is still covered in woodland. Okay, it's got the, the towers on top. In fact, I can see the Channel 9 tower right there. But it hasn't been developed. We don't have houses up here and petrol stations and fast food restaurants. There we go. Thanks very much for watching the video. I hope you liked it. If you did, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. See you again soon. And don't forget about the free offer. Type in the coupon code ROB to get free shipping on your DNA kit. And as an added bonus, you can start a 30-day free trial to My Heritage's best subscription for family history research. Do it now. I did. I'm not lost, I just don't know where I am. I got lost in an art gallery once. Ended up in a room full of broidles, skating about all hours of the night. <laughs>